Welcome to class, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining class this morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I hope you're excited to go through chapter four. OK? Um, we're looking at chapter four, where we are talking about the prophecies concerning the coming of uh, Jesus Christ, um, God incarnation, that is God taking on the human form okay so before we look uh, at the Im uh, important old testament prophecies uh, we just stated an important fact and what is the important fact that we stated last class what is the important fact or truth that we stated about incarnation anyone remembers It was pre-planned, yes. It was not something that came up in the mind of God after Adam and Eve sinned or when things were going, when the Israelites were not, um, you know, obeying God, his laws, um, was not being the, the chosen people that he wanted them to be. It was not then that God thought, oh, you know, I have to have a plan of salvation. I need to send the Savior, the Messiah, but it was already pre-planned. And how do we know that? How do we know that? What is the scripture passage? First Peter chapter 19 and 20. Okay, everyone, wake up, please. It's all in your notes, which means that none of you have read through your notes and come to class. It's very important that you read through and come so that you're able to, you know, um, connect with what is being taught in today's class, okay? So the important uh, fact that we mentioned is that incarnation was something that God had thought of even before the foundation of the world, okay? It was a planned thing in the mind of God in the ages past. And we know this from First Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Okay, now why are we mentioning this? Because the the Jews were looking for a Messiah, right? They were looking forward for a Messiah. And what was the Jewish understanding of the Messiah? That uh, he is a political king. Yes, thank you, Sir Gertrude. He was a political king. Thank you, uh, Nelson, that he's a king. He will come as a king and he will conquer and he will rule. Okay, so why didn't they, this whole aspect of uh, Jesus as the Messiah, the King, come into their minds? The Messiah is King. Yes. Go ahead, Sister Gertrude. Yeah, because they were oppressed by the Romans and they wanted a political leader to save them from their oppression. Yes, they were oppressed by the Romans, okay? Um, they were feeling so oppressed, not only by the taxes, but the kind of rules, the regulations, the um, uh, even the persecution they were going through, you know? Uh, so they um, were looking for someone who would come and give them freedom and give them their own political state and, you know, um, uh, rule so that they can have freedom okay and they were looking for someone who can remove them from enslavement to giving them freedom and they did not think that this messiah would come as a as somebody would be crucified on the cross okay it would come like this lamb of god would be crucified but they were looking for a liberator they were looking for someone who liberate them and they were looking for a triumphant king okay so this is the whole understanding in the jewish mind was their understanding right was their understanding right no sister no, no it wasn't right because and they failed to even look at and understand the old testament prophecies we can understand that the common uh, people were not able to understand and they had this mindset but it's sad that the high priest and the scribes also had the same understanding so we see that you know the israelites were not looking 
um, or not focus so much on God, but they were looking for their own, their, their own, they had their own selfish agendas. Some, and it's so typical of the, the, uh, their forefathers, right, in the desert. Every time they didn't get water, every time they didn't have food, they would grumble, right? We had fish and melons, we ate in, and watermelons and cucumber, we ate in, in Egypt, we want to go back to Egypt. Here in this desert, we don't have anything, okay? So always constantly grumbling and murmuring because they were so self-focused. They were not looking at uh, God. And so also they, they continued with the same thing. And here also we see that when they became, you know, I mean, um, here when, when the time was right for the Messiah to come, that they were also again looking for somebody who was a political Messiah who would give them freedom. Okay. And they failed to see what the prophets had prophesied and who this Messiah truly would be. Okay. So we look at the, um, the prophecies concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Messiah. The first one we look at is in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. And this is called as the Edenic covenant uh, the promise that god makes in the garden so can somebody please read genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 please so the lord god said to the serpent because you have done this you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field on your belly you shall go and you shall eat the dust all the days of your life and i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, so did any of you know that this was a covenant? Oh, did any of you know this is a covenant? One of you say, but whenever we read this, what do we, what comes to our mind? Curse, yes, comes as a curse, as a punishment. We never see this as a covenant. What is another word for covenant? Promise, right? But actually, this is referred to as the proto-evangel. What is the meaning of proto? The Greek word proto means first. Evangel means gospel. So this is the first gospel that is being preached to the world or being manifested to the world, known to the world, is in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15 okay and this is also not only just a proto evangel but also is the first messianic prophecy this is also known as the first messianic prophecy that means messianic means is referring to the coming of the messiah messianic spelling is m e s s i a n i c the first messianic prophecy or the first prophecy referring to the coming of the messiah and it's also referred to as the Edenic Covenant. Okay, Why is it referred to as the Edenic Covenant? Because it's establishing the consequences and it's establishing the promises following Adam and Eve's disobedience. Okay, So here we see that Adam and Eve had disobeyed God. And God is, of course, we look at it as, you know, a curse or a punishment. But... He's establishing the consequences of their disobedience and the promises. He, he is also making promises here. So the covenantal nature, we don't see specifically mentioned here that God is making a covenant. Like for Abraham, he makes a covenant with him. Or Noah makes a covenant with him. But here it's not specifically mentioned that this is a covenant. But we see the nature of a covenant here. When God is pronouncing, you know, specific outcomes based on the actions of Adam and Eve and also the promise that is to come. So every covenant has a promise and also every covenant has specific outcomes. If you don't keep this covenant, this is the punishment. So here also we see the outcomes and also we see the promise. What is the promise here? Put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Okay. So the promise here is that you shall bruise the 
uh, serpent's head. head. Okay, you shall bruise his head. Okay, so here it is talking about the promise that we are going, we can. There's somebody who's going to come who is going to defeat Satan, and we also can defeat uh, Satan. And also, we see that this Edenic covenant is the basis for the development of all redemptive covenants. So, this is this covenant here mentioned in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, is the basis for the development. That means this is the main foundation, this covenant. It's the main foundation for the development of all redemptive covenants. What is the meaning of redemptive? What is the meaning of redemptive? Saving. Yeah, saving, rescuing, delivering covenants. That is going to come in the Bible. So although the word covenant is not used here in these verses, you know, um, but it, it has the promise. It also is mentioning the requirements that is very clear of all other biblical covenants that we see in the Bible. And also if you look at Hosea chapter 6 verse 7, okay, all this is not in your notes. If you want to make notes of it, you can. If you look at Hosea chapter 6 verse 7, can somebody read that please? Hosea chapter 6 verse 7. Hosea chapter 6 verse 7, but like men, they transgressed the covenant. Uh, there they dealt, uh, treat, sorry, with me. Thank you. So here it says, but like men, no? you read men. What did you read? Yeah, like 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 men. Uh, they transgressed the covenant. That means what is the meaning of transgressed? They disobeyed, they sinned, they did something wrong, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, this verse in KJV and NKJV, it talks about like men. But in other translations, it has but like Adam. But like Adam transgressed the covenant, they, there they dealt faithlessly with me. So only in KJV and NKJV it talks about men. But if you look at even in KJV and NKJV, the, the footnote has like Adam. Okay, since the name Adam means, one of the names of Adam means man. Okay, so here it's basically talking in Hosea chapter 6 verse 7, the prophet Hosea is talking about this, um, uh, what happened in the Garden of Eden, and it's talking about this covenant in Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. Okay, now if you look at this verse, verses in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, you know, uh, this verse can be looked at in a very figurative sense. What do I mean by figurative? Figurative sense means? Means one thing is can be said in a form or a figure of another. Okay, so I'll explain. One thing can be said in the form or the figure of an other. For example, the serpent. The serpent here is representative of whom? Satan or the devil. How do we know that? Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. If you look at Revelation chapter 12 verse 9, it talks about the great dragon that was hurled down, the ancient serpent called devil or Satan. So there it's mentioned that the ancient serpent is called the devil or Satan. So here in this verse in Genesis chapter 3 verse 14, when we, when we look at serpent, it's figurative or it's representing whom? Representing whom? Devil or Satan. Okay. Now the woman is representative of whom? The, the woman here in this verse. The woman is representative of whom? World. Okay, it's representative of um, the entire human race. Okay, all the people in this world. And the phrase, her seed, is representative of whom? Her seed? Jesus. Why are you saying Jesus? 
the seed of the woman okay if you look at the seed here how is the capital s right yes or no isn't it odd that it's a capital s it should be a small s right but here it's talking about um, it's talking about jesus the messiah who would come okay also the word seed could could be understood in a singular word or in a collective way could be understood both either as singular or collective so it can be either understood as jesus or the seed can also be understood as we okay so it could the words he and his could also be understood in the plural as it or they okay so i'm talking about this verse you might be wondering where what am i saying if you look at this verse genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 many of you here are looking very puzzled so i thought i i please look at your uh, notes okay verse 14 it says serpent serpent represents whom and devil okay and here it says i'll put enmity between you and the woman verse 15 woman is whom it represent in the entire human race here it talks about your seed who can it be and her seed her seed the capital s referring to jesus your seed can also and the he and uh, his heel can also mean you know uh, singular or plural okay it can be it or they okay it can either be understood as um, we or it can be also understood as jesus okay now the word head can you see head over there yes in verse 15 head is referring to whom satan okay head the hebrew word is basically rosh okay and uh, the translation for the hebrew word rosh means somebody who's a prince somebody who's a leader who's a chief who's supreme and specifically referring to satan so two important facts that we can uh, gather from this edenic covenant the first one is that enmity is going to exist between whom? Enmity is going to exist between whom? Between the Satan and the human race. Yes, thank you, Lucy. Between Satan and the human race. Okay. And it also implies that God is going to reconcile the world to himself. Or God is going to reconcile the human race to him self implying that the messiah who is going to come okay is going to reconcile the human race back to god and this was made possible through the finished work of jesus on the cross okay the second important fact that we can learn from this scripture passage is that the seed of the woman will bruise or will crush the head of the serpent that is satan and this was fulfilled by whom jesus christ jesus christ when lucy at the cross on the cross yes on the cross jesus disarmed every principality every power he also destroyed him who had the power of death that is the devil how do we know that look at what hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 18 says can somebody read that hebrews chapter 2 verses verse 14 please Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Inasmuch. Yeah, go ahead, Lucy. Inasmuch, then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Yes. So Jesus, through his work on the cross, destroyed Satan, disarmed him, he is rendered powerless and without any power okay so here we see that the he shall bruise your head is talking and you shall bruise his heel you know and you shall bruise his heel his heel is talking about whose heel satan's heel okay okay and he shall bruise your head it's not just talking about singular as i said it's also talking about selective uh, I mean, uh, not singular, but also, um, 
yeah it uh, also collective okay so it can stand even for it or they so it's not just jesus of course jesus disarmed every principality and power on the cross but if you look at romans chapter 16 verse 20 what does it say romans 16 verse 20 and the god of peace will crush satan under your feet shortly the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you amen amen so here we see thank you lucy so here we see that even who will crush satan under your feet who will crush satan under your feet god of peace and the god of peace will crush satan under your feet shortly okay so this is also being fulfilled by the people of god that means we will also you know crush satan we will also overcome satan because god has given us the authorities he's given us the weapons for our warfare okay so that's why i said the uh, it can also mean collective and it can also mean singular okay the it and the they can also mean collective and singular uh, jesus already disarmed satan but we also can or we also have the power and the authority to overcome satan and crush satan underneath our feet okay and the serpent was to bruise his heel shows that you know there'll be a prolonged struggle between good and evil even though jesus has disarmed satan on the cross but we still have to engage in spiritual warfare satan still comes against us okay even though he's powerless he still comes against us and we have been given the power and the authority to crush satan underneath our feet and so it shows that there will be a prolonged struggle between good and evil till the time when uh, you know jesus will flung satan into the bottomless pit okay so that is the edenic covenant anyone has any questions sister the capital h his heel the he and the his could also be plural. It could stand for it or they. So it can mean it is the Messiah. It can also mean they as the believers. Who the, can the, yeah, the, You shall bruise his heel. H-I-S. Yeah, you shall bruise his heel. Yes. His heel is whose heel? And you shall bruise his heel? It's talking about Satan will bruise you know our heel it also will um uh, will come against uh, the messiah but you know jesus overcame uh, satan on the cross and he defeated him yes okay, okay sister thank you yes yeah, sister get rude uh, sister i have a question yes uh, after the millennial rule for thousand years god will again lose satan for a period of time I mean, I just wanted to know why. <laughs> Good question. Yes, why? You know, when when uh, the thousand millennium rule, temporarily Satan and his forces will be there um, in Hades. You know, why would, um, after the thousand year rule, why will again God release uh, Satan? Because, you know, um, some... Um, you know, commentary writers, theologians say it's um, a, a time also for God to know. Of course, all of us will be there during the millennium rule. Okay, we will all experience God's um, Jesus Himself ruling us. It will be a wonderful uh, time. But also, God wants to know who is really for Him and who is not for Him. So, who really? You know, um, uh, so all of us will again be given a test at that time to really stand up for God. Okay, so that is why he will release Satan and Satan will come and again start his temptation and, and everything. And then, you know, some of them who have also been there during the thousand year rule will fall back, will get easily tempted and drawn away and swayed away by Satan. And so God um, would know at that time who is really for him, makes a stand for him and choose, chooses him and who really will fall away from so that is why he will release him and that's when he will really know who is for him and not for him it's not that god is like um you know wicked in a sense but he really wants to know who really stands up for him so that's when satan will be released and he will have his uh, sway over people 
and those who do not stand the test of time and stand the temptation and overcome it and uh, you know um, live their allegiance to Jesus Christ or to God you know uh, will know by their choice and then will be the, the final um, you know casting off Satan in and his demons and all those who do not stand up for God into eternal fire but sister God will all will know beforehand who will stand for him he's omniscient God right he knows beforehand who will stand and who will not stand for him yes he knows it's not that he wants to confirm because he already knows it just um, it's just for us for us to know who we really stand up for are we really in that thousand year rule just uh, living our lives because of uh, because God is ruling and we remember that the word of God says when he comes the second time he will come not as the lamb you know the lamb that was a silent lamb that took on the sins of the world did not uh, did not fight back did not retaliate but he will come as a lion of judah right and it the the prophecies talk about how he will rule with an iron scepter his rule will be in the thousand millennium rule will be a glorious time but it will also be a time when it will be a strict you know, rule because God Himself is ruling. There will be no space for sin and yielding to this one and all sin and all of those things because He will rule with an iron fist, with a lion hand. He's the lion of Judah who will come at that time and rule. And so many of them will just will not do things because of that of the rule of God and the reign of God. But God wants to know hey, really who is in love, has that love and the deep devotion. And, and living their lives out of that deep sense of devotion and love for God, not because, okay, the rule and the reign of God, and you have to do this, you know, and you have to live this way, but, you know, who's, uh, who's willing to do that out of love and deep sense of devotion and respect for God? Thank you, sister. So it's a choice that we have to make, and it's, our, uh, you know, it's finally a test of our allegiance and our devotion to who God is and what he's done for us. So that is what um, the commentary writers um, comment and say on, on this thought. OK. OK, so we'll move on. Anyone has uh, any questions? OK, we look at the other prophecy, the second prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. It is the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the covenant of the promise that God makes to Abraham. So let's read Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. Can somebody read that, please? Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Yes. So here, um, as part of God's covenant to Abraham, God is promising that through Abraham's seed, or through Abraham's descendant, children's children, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So here, again, God is promising the coming forth of the Messiah who would come from Abraham's lineage also is and this is also repeated in um, in Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 where he God promises Abraham that through you all the families of the earth will be blessed okay so when he's talking about that he's talking about how you know through Abraham's descendant Jesus will come and through Jesus all the nations of the earth will be blessed so to uh, understand this Abrahamic covenant in a deeper way let's look at Galatians chapter 3 verses 8 and verse 16 so can somebody please read uh, Galatians chapter 3 verses verses 8 and verse 16 and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying in you all the nations shall be blessed now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made he does not say and to seeds as of many but as of one and to your seed who is Christ amen so here um, you know um, Paul is making very clear that the Messiah who is to come he's telling the Jews is not through you know uh, the Jewish lineage because 
Now you must understand that when Paul is writing to the church at Galatia, uh, Galatia or to the Romans, uh, the Jews who um, were, um, you know, becoming Christians and becoming believers, they're coming to the church. As like I mentioned very often in every class, I think, you know, uh, they were bringing in the Jewish rituals. And they're saying, hey, you have to follow all of these Jewish rituals, myths, ideology, genealogies, and all of these things. Then only you will be uh, reconciled to God. You will be justified before God. And so Paul is saying, hey, it's not just through, uh, you know, uh, through the Jewish race, Abraham's lineage, that all the nations of the world will be blessed. But he's saying, through your seed. It's not talking about seeds in terms of many. It's talking about seed. And he's here again putting a capital S. And he's saying, he's specifically saying, the seed is referring to whom? Christ, Jesus Christ. So the seed indicates that God was speaking about Christ himself. Okay. And in the American Standard Version, if you read this, it says, in thy seed, T H Y, thy, which is referring to God. In thy seed, all the nations bless themselves, okay? So he's saying that all the nations of the earth will be blessed, not through us being a Jewish lineage, but it is through Christ that they will receive their blessings, okay? And, um, and not everyone will just be, all the nations will be blessed just like that, but all those who believe that Jesus is, God who believe that he is the Messiah, you know, who actively proclaim that Christ uh, is the king, Christ is God, Christ is the Messiah, they will be the blessed nation. They will be the blessed uh, people. But however, not all nations seek him, not all nations acknowledge that he is the Messiah, that he is God. But here when he's talking about this in the Abrahamic covenant, is specifically referring to Jesus Christ as the Messiah who will come in the lineage of Abraham. Okay. The next one is, um, the next prophecy we look at is in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10. Can somebody read Genesis chapter 49 verse 10, please? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Yes, so here we see that, you know, uh, Judah uh, inherit the leadership aspect of the firstborn inheritance. Who was the firstborn of uh, Jacob? Who was the firstborn of Jacob? Reuben, right? But Reuben did not receive his um, uh, leadership position. He did not receive his inheritance. Why? Because he had, um, you know, significantly gone against, you know, uh, done what was, um, you know, unholy in God's sight because of his actions and his transgressions, uh, his sin that he had committed. We read this in Genesis chapter 35, verse 30, 22, and Genesis 49, verse 3 to 4. So his birthright was given to whom? Reuben's birthright was given to Joseph, okay? Because we see that, you know, the firstborn receives the inheritance they receive the firstborn's inheritance they also receive a double portion uh, according to the tradition of the inheritance but here we see that reuben's inheritance goes to um, uh, joseph and also we see that you know the leadership responsibility goes to judah okay so that is why jesus comes in the line of judah lineage of Judah. He's referred to as the Lion of Judah. Okay, so um, here it's talking about Judah who takes on the leadership responsibility. Okay, the leadership aspect of the firstborn inheritance is given to Judah. So the leadership position among the brothers meant that eventually all the kings of Israel would come from which tribe? The tribe of Judah. Okay. And that the Messiah would be the ultimate leader, the ultimate king, would eventually come from the tribe of Judah. And we read this in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, where Jesus is called as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So this prophecy foretells or very clearly foretells the coming of the particular 
individual who is the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ, would come from the tribe of Judah. Okay. Now, this other word Shiloh here, in the Old Testament times, Shiloh was a city where the tabernacle of God was set up. Okay, It was a meeting place where God would meet with the people of Israel before Solomon built the temple. Okay, And we see that this uh, city was later destroyed. We read this in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. The city of Shiloh was later uh, destroyed. Now, um, ancient Jewish scholars explain that Shiloh came from the words shell and lo. Okay, shell and lo means to whom it belongs. So, if you read the sentence, it basically says, "The script, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until the one who comes to whom it belongs." That means. The, the the rulers of the of Israel will come from the tribe of Judah, right? But the last king was destroyed by the, the Babylonians and the Syrians. Okay, there was no more kings that come, but then there was a silent period, and then Jesus uh, uh, is born, okay? And he will come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He will come and rule as a king later on. So here we see that, you know, the scepter shall not depart, means the scepter, you know what's the meaning of scepter, right? What is a scepter? It means that, you know, that rod, that staff that the king has, okay, uh, which shows his power and his authority. Like when Esther came in and the king did not give her permission to come and he just stretches out his scepter. That means, you know, you're pardoned. Even though I didn't invite you, it's come in, you're pardoned. Okay. So saying the scepter means the rule and the authority. The scepter means the rule and the authority will not depart from Judah. There will be a king who would come, an everlasting king would come and rule, and it will, it will be the one to whom it belongs. And to whom it belongs? To whom does it belong? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lucy. Um, to Jesus Christ, to whom it belongs. Okay. So Jesus came uh, from the royal tribe of Judah. We read this also in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. Okay. And this also prophesies about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It says, To him shall be the obedience of the people. In another version, it says, Unto him shall the gathering of the people be, and the nations will obey him. So it also refers to not just the, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, but also talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, all of you are able to understand? All of you are present in the, in the class, not just physically, mentally also? Able to understand intellectually also? Yes? Any questions, any doubts? Okay. If there are no questions and doubts, we'll move on to the uh, fourth prophecy, which is talking about uh, the prophet like a prophet will come like Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and 18. So can somebody please read Deuteronomy 18, 15 and 18, please? The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Amen. Thank you. So here you look at um, the word prophet. Okay. Again, it's a capital P. Okay. It's, so it's not talking about any human being. It's referring to whom? Jesus Christ. It's referring to God, it's referring to Jesus Christ, okay? So he's talking about a prophet. And how do we know that this is referring to Jesus Christ, this Old Testament prophecy? Because Apostle Peter quotes this in his sermon in Acts chapter 3. This is a sermon that he preaches when? When? Then on the day of? Pentecost, yes. Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, yes, thank you. Um, so he's revealing to the crowd that is there and also revealing to us that this prophet is referred to as Christ himself. This prophet is referring to Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. 
okay and also we see that john testifies that jesus is the messiah that we are looking for when he said in john chapter 3 verse 34 for the one who god has sent speaks the word of god for god gives the spirit without limit he's talking about john the baptist here is testify about the coming of the messiah because god told john the baptist but that he is the one who's going to confirm and tell the people that this is the messiah how how is john the baptist not going to know for sure who is the messiah how is john the baptist going to know for sure that this is the messiah what was the one proof hello everyone in class can he i have said, uh, john the baptist said uh, there's someone who will come after me and i'm not worthy to tie his uh, two laces <laughs> yes thank you get true so who is he referring to but what is the assurance he's going to have that this is the messiah what was the sign that god was going to give him thank you nelson somebody here in class um, thank you, Shaker. The Holy Spirit descended on him on his baptism. Hello, everyone. Baptism of Jesus Christ. When the dove came, rested on Jesus, was a sign that this was the Messiah. Very, very important. Okay. So, um, you know, so talking about even how John testifies that he is the Messiah. Okay. And um, the next prophecy, the fifth one we will look at is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Okay. Can somebody read that, please? Before the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Amen. Thank you. And Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, which we studied um, in chapter... Um, I think chapter two, we studied this quite in detail. Okay, he's talking about prophesying about Jesus as God when we're looking about the deity of Jesus Christ. So we studied Isaiah 9, verse 6. I'm not going to, um, you know, uh, uh, explain this in detail, but these two passages, you know, foretell the birth of Jesus Christ. And these were prophecies that were given 700 years before their fulfillment so the the one in isaiah chapter 7 was 14 saying that you know a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name as emmanuel so even when the angel comes tells uh, mary that he will be called emmanuel okay so these are the prophecies that talk about um, how a virgin shall bear a son Okay, the sixth prophecy is in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. We already studied this in chapter 1 and chapter 2, where it's talking about the literal fulfillment of Christ coming out of Judah. Okay, um, we, we saw this when the wise men come, Herod calls the chief priests and the, and the teachers of the law, and he asks them, where is the Messiah to be born? And they look at the scrolls and they pull out Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Okay, and they say, this is what the prophets have written so i'm not going to explain this because i've already explained this when we studied it in chapter one and chapter two okay the seventh prophecy that's talking about the incarnation of jesus christ of the coming of the messiah is in zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 so can somebody please read zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 please rejoice greatly o daughter of zion shout o daughter of jerusalem behold your king is coming to you he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Amen. So here Zechariah is prophesying 400 years before Jesus entered Jerusalem on a horse, right? On a donkey. <laughs> okay. Somebody is alive and... Uh, uh, you know, not sleeping in class. Okay. So Jesus entered uh, Jerusalem on a uh, colt, donkey's colt. Okay, the colt of a donkey. And so here we see that this was already prophesied by Zechariah, 400 years. And we see that fulfilled by Jesus. So we can say that this is talking about uh, Jesus who is the Messiah. The eighth prophecy we look at is in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Okay, can somebody read Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 please? 
Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 Behold I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you, whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight behold he is coming says the Lord of hosts yes thank you so here look at the word messenger okay um, we see that you know Behold, I send my messenger. Okay, and the cap, the the, the my is in capital, capital oh. M, right? So who is the my here? God. Behold, I send my messenger. Look at the messenger there. It's a small M or capital M? Small M. Oh, yeah. Okay, and look at what it says. Even the messenger of the covenant. What is the messenger there? Capital M or small M? capital M. So who is this messenger in the beginning of this uh, in this chapter verse 1? Behold, I send my messenger John the Baptist. Yes. And who is referring to even the messenger of the covenant? Jesus. Yes. Okay. So we see that Jesus quotes Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 in Matthew chapter 11 verse 10. But Jesus says, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Okay. So Jesus is quoting here Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Okay. And he says, I will send my messenger ahead of you. So who is the messenger here? Is Jesus referring to John the Baptist. John the Baptist would prepare the way for whom? Jesus. Right. Uh, and we know this from Matt, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 46, and John chapter 1, verse 23. John replies in, in verse chapter 1, verse 23. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. So uh, John the Baptist is saying, this is... I am the one who Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. What does Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 say? A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Okay, so this was prophesied by Isaiah and John the Baptist is saying, hey, this was prophesied by Isaiah the prophet and I am the one I am that voice calling out in the desert okay so this is the messenger that the first messenger the first uh, messenger that we see in Malachi chapter 1 uh, chapter 3 verse 1 is referring to John the Baptist okay okay so here it talks about prepare the way before me and the Lord who you will seek uh, I'm reading from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, the latter half of the verse. It says, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So who is it talking about here? And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So who is he talking about? It's talking about Jesus. Okay, um, and the fulfillment of which seems to be referring to in John chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Okay, when Jesus suddenly comes to the temple and he clears it of all those who are selling uh, sh cattle and sheep and doves. Okay, so he comes to the temple and he clears it. So this is maybe talking about with, uh, referring to this passage um, where he is talking about he will suddenly come to his temple. Okay. Okay. We look at this um, prophecy. We'll study this in detail in the next class. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay. If there are no questions, we'll end class. Thank you all for um, joining class. I will meet you on Friday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sister.